My name is Jody Shafroff, and I'm the director at the Athenaeum, the Beckett Athenaeum, the library that serves Beckett in Washington. And we're excited to continue programming, um, albeit virtually, <laughs> uh, this year and probably the first half of next year as well, uh, until we can do outdoor stuff next year and, and you know, all those untils that 2020 has brought to us. Um, and uh, we normally in the library have workshops, presentations, author readings, uh, our book club, um, movie nights, you know, things like that for the community. Um, and we've gone virtually for this year, but all of the programming, whether it's uh, virtual for staff working to organize all of it, um, or bringing in uh, workshop teachers. Uh, the funding comes from the Central Berkshire Fund uh, through the Berkshire Takana Community Foundation. So we owe a lot of community programming to them. Good afternoon, Lynn. Good to see you both. Um, but uh, if you all have any ideas for additional authors I should be talking to who would like uh, to do a reading, and presentation uh, of their work, uh, please uh, send it in the chat or in an email later on. Hopefully you're all receiving our newsletters. If you aren't, you can also send that to me in the chat and we'll make sure to add you in. Um, and in the meantime, I'm gonna turn it over to Robin Catalano, who is a travel writer. And uh, I have some, uh, photos she sent me that I'll occasionally screen share so you can see some of what she's talking to. So Robin, whenever you do want that started, let me know. But in the meantime, I'm going to leave you as the main screen. Okay. And I, I will, be, um, you know, once I get uh, about a minute in, I would go ahead and start showing the photos of okay. that the way you guys can see the area that I'm going to be talking about in Spain, which is not an area that most folks from the United States know a lot about. So it's just right. kind of interesting to be able to see it. Okay. Let me just figure out, okay. Just trying to come through and, uh, okay, there we go. Robin, it's all you. All right, everybody can hear me? Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. This is mushroom hunting in Soria. A key, I shout partly out of economy and partly because in my moment of excitement, I've lost the ability to say I found a bunch of mushrooms in Spanish. The smooth rusty heads of three porcinis stare up at me from a mossy patch of forest floor of the Urbion National Hunting Reserve in Navaleno and the north central province of Soria, Spain. With my fingers, I grasp the solid stem of the closest mushroom and wiggle it back and forth until it pulls free from the earth, bits of dark soil clinging around its base. I hold it up like a trophy. My husband, Florin, and his mother, Frances, find me. We liberate the remaining mushrooms and place them in the baskets where the rest of the family has already amassed at least four pounds of the prized wild fungus. We've come to Soria, all five Garcias, including Florin and Frances, Florin's father, Florencio, and his two brothers, Nacho and Jordi, plus Jordi's girlfriend, Raquel, to celebrate Frances' 70th birthday. As is always the case on our annual visits, I am the only American. My Spanish skills, thanks to four years of mostly forgotten high school classes, are roughly equivalent to that of a grade schooler. I've occasionally had the time and money to put toward private tutors, and I'm marginally better than I used to be. But here in the forest, I don't need to say much to be understood. Florin and I drove out early that morning in October, his parents' suburban brick high-rise barrio of Alameda de Asuna in Madrid's Bajara, now I'm gonna do this wrong, Bajaras district, receding in the rear view. Within a half hour, we had passed through the ever-present congestion and commotion of the city. After 30 minutes more, I was asleep in the passenger seat, the effects of the late night before combining with the sun slanting through the window and the motion of the little red Hyundai to lull me. When I woke up on the outskirts of Soria, it was as if we had entered a different place or at least another season. The N110 highway was wide, newly painted and nearly empty. We took the occasional detour around an unfinished stretch of overpass, 
a sign that as Madrid, Barcelona, and Seville teeter closer to the edge of over-tourism, Soria is on the verge of becoming the next big des destination for Spaniards seeking escape from the cities. The dry, dun-colored landscape of central Spain, with its long stretches of shrubless hills, its broad groves of olive trees, its remnants of century-old castillos dotting the landscape, had given way to clay-red escarpments abutting moderate-sized cliffs topped with scrubby pom-pom-headed bushes. In the flatter areas between them, long green grasses with parched yellow tips murmured in the breeze. These were interspersed with large rectangles of cultivated crops, mostly legumes and grains, rendered in alternating stripes of light and dark green from the raking of farm machinery. The air was cooler here. Still, Spain's intense late summer heat had dried up most of the fields of sunflowers, their golden heads tinged with black and weeping downward. As we neared the Duero River, one of Spain's famed wine-producing regions, the landscape became denser with growth. Skinny trunk trees, their long arms exploding into a riot of green leaves, stretched toward the sky like castaways signaling from a wreck on the beach. As we rounded a corner here and crossed a big bridge there, small villages with musical names like San Esteban de Gormaz occasionally popped into view. They seemed to be carved out of the hillsides themselves, with terracotta tiled churches and medieval stone towers glowering from above. I took pictures from my rolled down car window. I jotted names in a doll-sized notebook. I asked for Spanish translations of what I was seeing. Traveling in Spain with a Spaniard, especially when you're married to, is a double-edged sword. The culture puts a premium on travel from an early age, so many Spaniards are likely to have been to these destinations, where the history comes from, jokes Warren, borrowing from comedian Eddie Izzard before. They can suss out the best routes and quickly home in on good spots for beer and views of telegenic hillsides, and will probably be able to recount some of their history. But it's mostly old hat to them. They won't share your wonder as you gawp at every porticoed church and crenellated tower, and they definitely won't pause to admire each crumbling castle. They also have to exercise patience with your incessant questions. What type of tree is that? What is this town's main industry? What are the spinning shimmery things on the top of roofs? Evergreen oak, viticulture, and roof turbine vents, respectively. In the northwest corner of Spain, of Soria, we arrive at Navaleno. The town is home to a robust wild mushroom following. From the Centro Nicologico de Navaleno, which offers classes in mushroom identification and cooking, exhibitions and children's workshops, to the annual fall mycology fair, the Castilian love for mushrooms runs so deep, the fungi are even included as button-hatted graphic icons on road signs for what to do while visiting. We turn off the main street and down a rutted gravel path to the Urbion Regional Hunting Reserve. More than 280,000 acres of forest, the preserve is prime real estate for buscar setas, or searching for mushrooms. A few days before, Jordi called the Mycological Center to ask for recommendations on good porcini hunting spots. Whether out of garden variety surliness or an abundance of protectiveness of Navaleno's natural prize, the woman on the other end of the phone tartly responded, you think I know every tree in the forest? Go out and look. It wasn't always this way. While a variety of mushrooms have historically been important in the cuisines of Spain, especially in Basque and Catalan country, Florin remembers only oysters, white buttons, and their orange counterpart, miscalos, and the occasional chanterelle crowding grocery store shelves when he was growing up in the late 70s and early 80s in Madrid. Nowadays, mushrooms are big business, and even typical Spanish tapas like croquetas have been given the mushroom makeover with bolitas instead of ham or codfish. In many parts of the country, one fungus is prized above all, the porcini. Spaniards aren't the only ones who love porcinis. After a few seasons of Soria's forests being plucked bare by Eastern Europeans, whose skill in hunting the most elusive wild mushrooms is unsurpassed, the Castilian government instituted licensing. You now have to fill out an application, show your passport, and pay a fee to harvest wild mushrooms at Urbino. Outside the car, small evergreen colored lizards hot-footed across the road. Florin consults his mobile phone, where Jordi has sent the family's GPS location. I pull a light jacket around me as we set off into the woods. Barely off the path, I spot a tall stalked mushroom with an umbrella-shaped head sunbathing beside a fallen log. It's not a porcini, but I point to it and say, there's one, is it edible? 
Fluorine clambers down the embankment and confirms my find, the parasol mushroom, an edible and less colorful doppelganger of the psychedelic Amanita. He finds another pair nearby and adds them to our bag. When we meet up with the rest of his family, they're carrying two mostly full baskets of porcinis. Inspired by their good fortune, we join forces, rambling over dried branches and desiccated pine cones that crackle underfoot. The air is still and filled with the scents of earth and pine and the sound of muted conversation. I walk beside Frances for a time. Like many of the older mushroom hunters in the forest, she walks slowly, hands clasped behind her back, face inclined downward. She chats in Spanish about the house we'll be staying in, the town, and the hunt, enunciating slowly so I can grasp the conversation. Then she says, Como esta tu papa? How is your father? I mean to answer that he's okay, but he's had some health problems and has to take medicine. But through a couple of unfortunate word substitutions, I actually say something closer to, he has problems with his greeting and has to take doctors. She stifles a laugh and nods. The conversations peter out, and I'm struck by the quiet of the woods, even with groups of people within a few hundred yards of one another. Francis drifts away toward Nacho, who has found a promising patch. Fifty feet or so in front of me, Jordan pokes at the ground with a stick, while Raquel inspects a long mound of grass. Florin and his father are at the far edge of the group, wordlessly searching. I bend frequently, spying small, slimy-topped mushrooms, or else tawny rounded shapes that are the exact size of medium porcini heads, but turn out to be look-alike rocks. We go on like this for a while. I get lost in the chittering of red squirrels and the paw of birds and the meditative sense that comes with a single-minded focus. Just when I think I'm looking at another rock and give it a lazy jab with my index finger, I feel the slight telltale give of flesh. I call out to the others. Once our baskets are full, we've got quite a bit, but not even close to the 10 kilo per person limit. We form a caravan into the center of Navaleno, where the sons have planned a birthday lunch for Francis. For the occasion, they've chosen La Lobita, a Michelin-starred fine dining restaurant that attracts Spaniards from hours away just to enjoy their tradition with a twist approach to Castilian cuisine. Founded in 1952 by Andres Lucas and Luciana Lobo, the eponymous Lobita, or Little Wolf, the restaurant is now run by the third generation of female chefs de cuisine. With Elena Lucas at the helm, La Lobita serves a lighter take on food inspired by her grandmother's traditional recipes. All feature farm-to-table ingredients, many from Elena's organic garden. And mushrooms, lots of them. Depending on the season, La Lobita showcases a dizzying array of forest fungi, from king bolites and black trumpets to black truffles, chanterelles, cesarean amanitas, and morels. When mushrooms aren't as plentiful in Navaleno, they tap Catalonia, Extremadura, and the Basque Country for varieties like the Marzuelo and Peritillo, or St. George's mushroom. We're ushered by Diego Munoz, Chef Lucas's husband and La Lobita's general manager and sommelier, through elegant sliding panels of glass and pine and into a sunny private room. It's minimally decorated with a large wood dining table, padded chairs, and a pendant lamp suspended from the ceiling. There's a sinuous driftwood sculpture in the center of the table. Once we're seated with a glass of Cava Blanca in our hands, it's less likely to cause stomach upset before the meal, you know, explains, the meal begins. Over a span of two and a half hours, we'll taste 14 courses, some little more than a bite, and some closer to the size of tapas. Mine are all vegetarian, a rarity in Spain. But these are nothing like the tapas I've grown accustomed to. The ovals of crispy on the outside, creamy on the inside, croquetas de bacalao, crunchy patatas aioli with their tangy, garlicky sauce, semi-cured manchego cheese with crusty bread, slightly oozy tortilla de patatas, Spain's national treasure of an omelet, or overflowing bowls of green olives. Even the three choices of bread, a hearty pueblo or rustic bread, triangles of thin crusted torta, and hunks of chewy whole grain with raisins seem different, new, special. Claro, of course, explains Munoz if, when I ask if I can try all three. It's the theme of the day as we're served delicate, artfully presented plates that invite interjections of wonder and near constant photo snapping from Raquel and me. There are tiny pillows filled with a mushroom cream and topped with slices of apple. A fat red raspberry piped full of a ganache-like mushroom filling. A tureen of mushroom pate styled to look like a tree stump and served atop crisp shredded beets with sauteed chanterelles. 
and Lala Beach's signature, a croquetta made with a truffled egg that squishes in a happy pool of yellow yolk and olive oil when cut. I didn't think any Spanish food could delight me more than socarra, the crispy caramelized bits of rice that stick to the bottom of a pa paella pan. But Elena Lucas is out to prove me wrong with an autumn stew of perfectly tender butternut squash, broccoli, morels, and miscolos. The chatter around the table grows. I fade in and out of the conversation, comprehending some and misunderstanding more. Florin and his brothers sometimes tire of translating. And when the family lapses into an extended bit of joking and laughter in Spanish, I don't fault them. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel left out, a spectator rather than a participant. But then a bowl of mushroom dumplings and a light, flavorful broth appears in front of us, and we're back to the communal experience of the meal. A pair of small wooden platters heaped with sweets are slid onto the table. We polish off shortbread cookies, thumb-sized squares of spiced cake, and toothpick-skewered chunks of dark chocolate that bloom in the mouth with the flavor of violets. Over little bowls of ice cream, we sing happy birthday in Spanish to Francis. I sing along. I know the words to that one. Afterward, at our rented apartment, Francis unpacks the mushrooms and lines them up by size on the formica table in the kitchen, evidence from the world's most cheerful crime scene. With a paring knife, she shaves off the dirtiest parts of the dense stems, plus any spots that look like they may have been snacks for hun hungry woodland critters. She chatters amiably with her sons. Whereas my own family back in the States probably would have retreated to separate corners after so much together time, when there's food, the Garcias are usually gathering. We return home to the Hudson Valley a few days later, a handful of porcinis tucked under the socks in our suitcase. Florin dries them in a dehydrator and packs them in a gallon zipper bag to be portioned out throughout the winter, when we typically eat meals while watching political comedy shows, a fleece blanket tossed over our laps. Here, I'm the occasional translator, explaining unusual idioms and obscure pop culture references. It doesn't escape me that he lives day to day in my comfort zone, or that our meals, while still one of the highlights of the day, have a different feeling. It's not better or worse than how we eat as a family in Spain, just different. With fall in its earliest stages, the gold and auburn leaves already setting the Taconic Mountains ablaze, we head out in the morning to look for the last of the season's mushrooms, honey or lion's mane, maybe some maitake. As usual, Florin's long strides have taken him out in front of me. He's halfway up a semi-steep semi incline when I spot a small group of round, oatmeal-colored mushroom heads just off the trail. I bend down, slice the stem at ground level, and turn it upside down. The tiny, downward-pointing teeth confirm my find, the hedgehog mushroom. Here, I shout, I found a bunch of mushrooms. <laughs> I have applause over here. <laughs> Thank you. Robin, do you want me to unmute everybody now? Yeah, I would say so. Are you ready? Okay. Wow. Okay. Beautifully graphic in its description. Thank you. you. Uh, I enjoyed that, Robin. Thanks, Sandy. Very nice. I did too. I, I would have liked to have seen a lot more pictures. The, yeah, me too. The descriptions were wonderful, but I really, I wanted to see what you saw too, besides oh. seeing your mind. <laughs> well, you'll be able to see some of that soon. The, the finished piece will be on my blog eventually, so it'll oh. actually have more pictures than the travel and major piece had. Okay, this was yeah. just to, to tease us. This was a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Right. It's just to hook you to keep you coming back. <laughs> we will. <laughs> when were you there, Robin? When was this? We were there, was it 2018? Or, yeah, it was 2018, right? Oh, okay. Was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, he's correcting me. It was actually last year. It was fall 2019. Right. And it's a, a really beautiful and interesting area of Spain. It's not like the most touristed areas that we're familiar with. It looks nothing like Madrid or Barcelona or Seville. 
uh, it has a very different feeling to it. And the food is, is very different as well. Could you spell, is it Asturias? It, uh, what, could you spell it? Yes, it's Soria, S-O-R-I-A. Okay, all right. It's, it's a province and also a city. Okay. To say 10 kilos of mushrooms is a lot right? of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I wish we had found that. 10 kilos per person. Per person, <laughs> right. What did you say? 20 pounds. Yes. 24 pounds, I think. Yeah. I know. Can you imagine finding 24 pounds of porcinis? Something, yeah. I, I enjoyed your uh, cultural contrasts, uh, just uh, the way families might engage with each other. And um, yeah, that's very, uh, I, I, my son lived in Spain for about 11 years. Oh, where did he live? Uh, he lived in um, Barcelona and then Madrid. Okay. Uh, but, but he traveled a lot and we traveled a little bit with him. And um, uh, of course, I always enjoyed, e I enjoy food and I enjoyed eating in Spain tremendously. And the Spaniards certainly seem to enjoy their food and they do. I think what strikes me about the food in Spain is that, you know, we, we often have the misconception that it's like Mexican food, you know, that it's spicy. It's not spicy. It's actually just very flavorful. And they rely on a lot of um, fresh flavors, you know, mushrooms in this case, and, you know, for this story. The flavor is so pronounced. It just, it makes everything that much better. And I really haven't had a bad dish in Spain. Right. I remember this uh, seafood, I think it's a seafood restaurant that we went into and they had these little teeny eels. They're only like that big. I know that's probably going to make you squirm a little, but <laughs> they were delicious. You, they served them like cat, like kind of almost like they were cooked, I think, but they were so, like almost like caviar with a wooden spoon. Oh, that's familiar. What is that? It's gulas from the north. Oh, so my husband is over here talking in my ear. So he said that's called gula and it's from the north of Spain. Okay. Yeah, that would probably Madrid. So that's probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well, when you do travel writing, you you write exclusively about places you've gone, and when you're there, is that your purpose in being there for the most part is to write about places? Kind of a mix. Occasionally, I go somewhere specifically to write the article. Yeah, um, in this case, this was a family vacation, and it just happened to be such a unique experience that when I came back and started thinking about, you know, what kind of things could I write about? I thought about this specifically because I hadn't really seen a story about mushroom hunting in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it takes on added resonance when you're doing it, when, no matter where you are, if you're doing it with people who live in the country. Mm -hmm. It's completely different than just being an American who parachutes in and does things her own way. I tried to do things the way that the family wanted to do them because they knew what they were doing and it just made more sense for me to kind of follow along to be part of the experience. Um, yeah, but that said, I do occasionally take a trip that is specifically for the purpose of writing the article and I think I'm going to have one coming up in December for that purpose. Where are you going? Or can you tell Maya Riviera. Where? Say it again. The Mayan Riviera? Oh, the, oh, oh wow. that's it. Yeah. Thank goodness. So I'm curious, you wrote it in the first person. Mm -hmm. It would make sense, but um, could you talk a little bit about, do you normally always write in the first person for stuff, for things like this, or is that's that? That's actually a fantastic question because it's a conversation we've been having a lot in travel writing lately. Um, there was movement away, I would say in the past, five or so years, a lot of travel writing used to be written in first person, and there's been a shift away from that recently. And if you talk to some editors, they'll say, well, I don't want, you know, I don't want your bias in the article, or I want it to be more authoritative. And they feel like it, it seems more authoritative when it's written in third person. I tend to disagree with that because I don't think you can ever take your personal bias out of a story, and especially when it comes to travel. We are all parachute, uh, you know, they, they talk about, you know, they don't want parachute writing. 
um, in travel writing, but we're all parachuting in. Unless you live in the place that you're writing about, which is a valid way to approach it too, you are going to have some degree of that sort of, um, you know, stranger in a strange land. And I think that writing in the first person can be a more honest expression in travel writing because it positions it as this is my opinion, this is my experience. Uh, it comes with all of my own cultural baggage that I'm taking with me on this trip. And it doesn't mean that somebody else's experience is going to be exactly the same way. I'm just trying to represent, you know, this was one moment in time, one experience that I had. So I actually prefer to write travel stories in first person, but I don't always. It depends on what the magazine wants from me. That's interesting. I, I think first person is more powerful. It's more immediate. And if, and if one person went somewhere and did something, that seems to me that maybe I could too. Whereas if it's written with, such, with a lot of, I don't know, authority, it, it seems more remote. And you can still, I would think in writing, include authority where, where it's required. Absolutely. I agree with you on that one. I don't think that there needs to be a stricture. And some magazines will actually say they don't accept travel writing written in first person. I don't think that stricture needs to exist. Um, I think it really depends on the story and what you're, what you're trying to tell. In this case, this was such a personal experience. I can't imagine writing it in third person. Um, but there are other stories that I have written in third person. And I felt, I felt fine with it. I felt comfortable with it. But for me, because I... I try to lean a little bit more toward the creative or literary style of travel writing than, you know, like listicles and things that you find online. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not making a judgment call about those. It's just what I prefer to do. And because that's the style that I lean toward, I find that first person really lends itself well. Mm -hmm. What were those two styles you mentioned? Literal that... versus... What were the two styles you mentioned? Literal versus... Oh, uh, literary travel writing versus uh, what they call service journalism, which that's more of the go here, see this, stay at this hotel. Got it. Or Got listicles, it. which are, you know, that's, you know, the 10 best things to do in the Hudson Valley, which I have written those because you know what, sometimes you pay the bills on what the client is offering you and sometimes that's what they want. But if it's up to me to decide what do I want to write about, it's going to be more like what I just read. Robin, um, one of the registrants who wasn't able to attend after all today, Lara Tupper, um, is also a writer. And she asked if we would ask her question to you, which is, sure. what is an ideal writing day for you? Like where, when, how, what is your style and need for that? So if I am left up to my own devices, um, like I was, so this summer I was the summer 2020 writer in residence at Arrowhead. And during the eight weeks of that residency, it was just me. It was whatever I wanted to do, whatever I wanted to write. And I didn't have to worry about other stuff. Um, and it was, it was glorious. I, I wish for that again. Um, so when I have a day like that, I have kind of a specific routine that I use to get myself in the writing zone. Um, and maybe this is more information than people need, but I do 10 minutes of journaling followed by 10 minutes of reading for pleasure. So no news, no business books, just something enjoyable. Um, and then 10 minutes of meditation. And then I sit down and I get to work right away. I tend to be an early morning person. That's when I get my best work done. So I'm usually at my computer by about 6.30, maybe seven o'clock in the morning. And I write for an hour without stopping. I take a little break. And if I have another hour in me, I go back to the computer and I do another hour. And then I try to quit for the day. And then the rest of the day can be, you know, administrative stuff or emails and that kind of thing. Yeah, and as for where, I, I am a, a lover of silence, <laughs> so I'm not like those writers that you see in movies who can, you know, set up their laptop in a bar or in Starbucks and bang out the great American novel. I need absolute silence and zero distractions, and I live in the middle of the woods, so that's very conducive to it. Um, I'm out in Steventown, New York, and I can't even see my closest neighbor, and it suits me just fine because there's very little noise or other distraction. 
it's generally only the distractions I create for myself. So I just have to keep that in check, like not checking email and not looking at my phone even if I get a notification. Okay. How about when you're traveling? Do you write while you're traveling or just take notes and journal? I take notes, yeah. I usually have a bunch of these little tiny notebooks that can fit in a pocket. Um, because I, first of all, I don't like a lot of bags and purses and things like that. And I find that women's clothing, and I'm sure all the women in this session can agree with me on this one, the pockets stink on women's clothing. Like they're just never deep enough. You can't put your phone in them. Um, so I'm always on the hunt for a good pair of pants with multiple pockets. I usually have, you know, cargo pants or whatever. And I keep several tiny notebooks and a tiny little pen. They truly are doll sized. I mean, you can hold it in your palm and kind of write like this. Um, but I've found that that's the best way for me to kind of record on the fly. I have tried using, I have like a, a tiny little clip on microphone that I can put on my lapel. That's good if I'm standing still, but if I'm out walking around, I'm usually picking up a lot of road noise or wind or whatever. Um, so I, I tend not to record that much. I almost never write, you know, like the actual mechanics of the article, I almost never get any of that started until I come home and have a chance to sort of think about it and outline the story. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Robin, how do you deal with, uh, after you've written for an hour or two in a day, do you find it beneficial to sleep on what you've thought and written and go back to it? Or how do you deal with revisions? Do you wait till you finish the article to go back or? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think one of the writer's greatest enemies is self-editing. And those of us who are good at self-editing are a little too good, you know? Like we sit there and actually be editing while we're writing, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. It's, it's really, it's bad for the creative process. So what I've tried to do, and this has taken me many, many years to figure out, um, I, I do the, the writing routine like I mentioned to you. Lately, I've been breaking these articles into sections. So I will give myself the goal of only doing the introduction in one day and then only doing the next section in the day. So I might spread it out over the course of four or five days to actually complete a draft of the article. And then I do like to let it sit for at least two or three days because I find that, um, and this is the case for anybody really, you know what you meant to write. So when you go back and look at it again, your mind is revising it on the page because it thinks, oh, this is what you meant to say. So you, you miss a lot of things that you wouldn't, that you would normally want to fix if you had fresher eyes. So that's why I think the stepping back for at least a couple of days is really, really important. How much time do they allow you to produce something like that? Or are you producing them and then pitching them? It's a mixture. So I've had some assignments. Um, I, by the way, always ask for more time just because I don't like to disappoint anybody or myself and I don't like to feel rushed. I've had some stories where the editor has asked me to complete it in two weeks. Ones that are more repertorial, you know, like I wrote a story on um, how the Hudson Valley has become the best area in the country for craft beverages. That one, I didn't, I didn't have a personal relationship with the story. And it doesn't mean I didn't enjoy writing it, but it wasn't personal like this story was. So that took me, I think I asked for an extra week. Um, and it took, me, it took me about a week to do the draft and then another few days to shape it up and submit it. With something like the story that I read, I actually, I wrote that because when I got home, I had the idea and I felt inspired. And as creative people, we know that that, feeling doesn't always come along. Sometimes it's, you know, you're, you're just putting yourself in the routine. And that's part of being creative too, is, you know, you have to do it consistently. Um, but for this one in particular, I just, I had the idea, the first paragraph came to me and I thought, I'm gonna sit down and write this thing before it leaves my brain completely. Because you know when you think you're gonna remember something and you don't, yeah. that happens a lot. Yeah, so I have tried to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that I don't let myself down in that way anymore. I'm just going to plug in my laptop to a different outlet because my battery is running low. Sorry about that. So in this piece, you wrote the piece and then looked for someone to publish it. Is that, is that right? I did. Yeah. And I, I, 
I had been in touch with Travel and Leisure about an entirely different piece. Again, it was about Spain, um, but it would have been more of like a, a weekend in, uh, and it was in a town called Burgo de Osma, which is it actually one of the pictures in there with the colorful buildings. Um, I was talking to them about writing a, a piece on that, and for whatever reason, you know, we went back and forth a few times, and then the editor decided it wasn't exactly what she wanted and asked me, did I have anything else? And I really didn't even think of this as a travel and leisure story when I first wrote it. Um, but I thought, okay, well, she's asking for something else. So I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do have a completely finished piece that you can take a look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and she really liked it. Uh, she was very happy with it, but she wanted it for a section of the magazine called Experiences, which only has shorter pieces. They're about a thousand words. And the piece that I read to you uh, is the original version that runs about 2,600 words. Mm -hmm. So I had to go and cut it down to a thousand words. So the, the piece that is in Travel and Leisure has quite a different feel because a lot of the stuff about, you know, kind of the family relationships and the disconnect with the communication, a lot of that got left on the cutting room floor for Travel and Leisure. Um, but I, I'm really excited now that, uh, you know, I had an exclusivity period with them, which expires at the end of this month. I'm going to try sending it out to magazines again, and I will also be putting it on my own blog so that I can have it in its original form. Mm -hmm. Exclusivity re relationship extends to your own blog as well. Say that again? Exclusivity relationship extends to your own blog as well. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so they had an exclusivity period of 90 days. So I couldn't publish it elsewhere for 90 days and that will be up at the end of November. And when you don't have an assignment and you are not otherwise feeling inspired, do you sit down and write anyway as part of the your, your rigor or routine? Do you try to write? Yeah. Yeah, I have multiple things going on at the same time so that I don't ever feel like I'm just doing one thing all the time. I find that that tends to be a recipe for monotony and it's a bit of a creativity killer. So um, I also have, I, I write young adult fiction. Um, so I've been working on a young adult novel and that's something that I like to do that first thing in the morning, sometimes even before the travel work because I like being in the imaginative space it's really nice sometimes to just write something that's entirely from your brain. You know, this, the, the story that I'm working on for the, the young adult novel is, um, it, you know, I have factual bits in it, but it's not like the research that I had to do with this one to look up information about gastronomy and the types of mushrooms and, you know, the timing of when certain things happened. I'm kind of creating everything right out of my mind. And I find that working on those kinds of projects makes me better at the, the more repertorial projects. Mm -hmm. What, did you tell us a little bit about what you did at Arrowhead, what your, what your, uh, what um, projects you worked on or whatever? The... Sure, yeah, yeah, that, that was a very, very cool uh, moment. And I, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm so happy and honored that I was chosen for it. Um, so I was there from, let me see, June 1st to September 1st, and I was able to actually go into Arrowhead. It was partly remote because of COVID, but I was able to go into Arrowhead two days a week and work in Herman Melville's study, like right in front of the view where he was looking out onto Mount Greylock, you know, the view that supposedly inspired Moby Dick. Um, and what was kind of cool about that is I am not a new agey person. I am super practical and very down to earth. Uh, but there was something about, you know, the first day that I got there and I sat down in the seat and I was like, ah, this is whatever. It's not going to be a big deal. And I looked out the window and I just thought, this is so cool. You know, it was just the, the feeling of having been surrounded by greatness. Um, I will say it felt a little bit sometimes like pressure because you know, I'm working in the shadow of a giant of American literature and I would not even pretend that I aspire to that. Um, but it was really, really cool to be able to just sort of absorb whatever energy was there and apply it to my own work. And I worked on, I think, three different travel pieces. Uh, again, all were first person narratives and one of them, uh, which is on my home state of Rhode Island, um, I sort of rediscovered it. I haven't spent much time there since I left in my mid-20s, but I've been going back a lot recently because my dad, who's on the call, you can see him at the bottom, that's Gerald, um, 
he moved to a new place in Rhode Island, and so I've been going back to visit him and help him get settled and whatnot. Well, I, I spent a good portion of the Arrowhead residency on that, and it's, an, it's another one like this one that has a lot of, um, you know, relationship to it. Nice. Yeah, it must have been quite an honor. Yeah, it must have been quite an honor to be selected for that. It absolutely was. Yeah. yeah. How did you get, how did you decide to become a writer? What was the genesis for that? Uh, I don't think I actually decided. If you ask my dad, um, I was writing since I was a little kid. You know, I started writing terrible stuff, by the way. I, I was not actually a functional writer until probably in my 20s. Um, the stuff that I wrote starting from like eight years old, I would write poems. I would just sort of make things up. I made up stories. I actually used to create my, my own magazine. I guess I was like a journalist in waiting even back then. Um, I was a gymnast and I decided I wanted a magazine about gymnastics. So I invented a magazine about gymnastics. And it was ridiculous. I, I have some of these things that my mom saved for me over the years and I look at them now and I think, I mean, I had a mad imagination and I think that's sort of crucial to being a writer. Um, but what I put out was not any good <laughs> for quite some time, all the way through high school. Uh, you know, I definitely improved my skills and I didn't know that I would definitely pursue writing as a profession. I was planning to go into archeology span because apparently I like low paying careers, I guess. Um, I was, I was planning to study archaeology in college, and as I was finishing up my senior year of high school, I went to see my senior English teacher, his name is Mr. Lawrence, at uh, Mount St. Charles Academy in Rhode Island, um, and I had gone to see him about some project that I worked on, and I was frustrated it wasn't coming out the way I wanted, and I said, you know, oh, can you help me with this, and we were talking, and I said, oh, you know what, I, I just give up, I, I don't think I, I want to do this, and he said, I would hate for you to leave this room and never write again. And for some reason, that stuck with me, that, you know, here was an adult, somebody who knew literature, who thought that I had some kind of talent. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, was one of the first times I actually said to myself, you know, maybe you should think about being a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At what point in a piece when you start writing it, do you realize it starts starting to come together? You know, or do they start rather loose and... and yeah. And yeah, you know, I have a very active self-critic that lives in the back of my mind and tells me that everything I'm creating is garbage while I'm creating it. Um, <laughs> Which is why I have had to learn to not self-edit while I'm working because I will completely derail my own process. I, I have to kind of get into a groove with something. Um, usually I can see that there are bits and pieces that I like. Oh, I like this turn of phrase. I think this transition is really cool. But usually the first draft that I create, I always think, oh, this is the worst thing you've ever written. And then I put it away for a few days and I come back and I look at it again and I think, yeah, you know what? It's not so bad. <laughs> I can work with this. So I don't throw out too many things that I write. I do throw out a few things because honestly, some things just should never see the light of day. And that's, it's practice. You know, it's, it's like going into a lab and experimenting. It's the same concept. But most stuff that I create, especially with the travel writing, I try to create it with purpose. And when, when I come back to it with fresh eyes, try to find the parts that I feel like, even if a bunch of it isn't salvageable, that's fine. What is salvageable? What do I want to repurpose? And what can I make into you know, a larger narrative? Do you have a specific length you usually like to write for? Do you have, are you a long form or a long piece? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I would say the sweet spot for me, if I'm just writing the articles myself, not necessarily because I have a particular publication in mind, they usually fall between 2,500 and 3,500 words, which these days is considered a little long. There are still some magazines that publish long form narrative. Um, most, most travel articles you'll find, even feature length articles are 2,000 words or less. And I just, you know, I sort of regret that a little bit. I regret that there's been this movement toward these really short, bite-sized pieces. Um, I understand that we're dealing with a different, 
attention span in today's readers, and a lot of that has to do with how we have formed reading habits online. Um, but it's unfortunate because there's so much richness of detail that you can accomplish in 2,500 words or 3,500 words that just can't be done in a thousand words. So I kind of wish we could go back to that. And um, I definitely will be looking more at uh, literary magazines as opposed to just the commercial travel magazines for my work. We're ac ac acquiring the relevant information for travel is itself part of the purpose of the, is part of the pleasure of reading the article, not just to, to garner information, but to enjoy the process of garnering that information. Oh, I like that. I like the way you said that. <laughs> okay, you can have it. I'll use that sometime. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, how, you know, you mentioned all those little notes you take. Yes. I just make sense of them and transcribe them <laughs> into something as vivid as what you seem to have read. Oh, wow. Yeah, so um, I will admit that my handwriting is awful and sometimes I can't read what I wrote. Um, that's disappointing. So I have tried to be more careful. I've had a bad habit of, you know, I'm walking and writing or riding in the car, not driving, but riding in the passenger seat and writing. And that makes everything much harder to read. What I typically do when I come home, first of all, I try to see like, what, what did I mean there? I think maybe I meant this. So I try to reconstruct the notes. And usually my first step is to read the notes out loud into a recorder. And then I let the recorder transcribe. I use Google Voice typing, um, and I let it transcribe all of my notes. So once I get them in a, an online form that I can look at on the screen, I start figuring out the outline of the story. You know, where do I want to start? Where do I want it to end? And, you know, what parts are going to go into the middle? Because with travel, what ends up happening is we have so many experiences and see so many things and places that they just can't all fit. Um, so we employ, I think it might be known this way in other literary circles too, but in travel writing, we talk about the accordion theory of time. And that's basically, you know, you zoom in on some experience that was interesting or worthwhile, and then you zoom out and you kind of give some general description. And then you zoom in again on one specific thing and you zoom out again. So I try to take that approach, pinpoint, you know, maybe four or five big things that you know, these are gonna be sort of the tent poles of the article. And then what are the other bits that I can kind of compress? I can sort of fold them all into one thing or one paragraph, or in some cases take things out of sequence, um, which I did with this article. There were a couple of things that didn't happen in the sequence that they do happen in the article, but it worked better for the narrative. And it's not, it's not untruthful, they actually did happen. It's just that you know, maybe it happened on a different day than what I said. Mm -hmm. Dramatic license. Did, did you ever have a mentor, Robin? Or does do writers have mentors? Or and if so, how do they acquire them? Or what kind of training? Yeah, I think a lot of writers do. I don't know that I personally. I have not had a live and in-person mentor before. I've had a lot of writers that I have worked with or alongside at different jobs. You know, people that I admired and I learned from their own process. Um, I think I learned a lot from being an editor too. I worked on staff as a book editor for quite a, a while. And that for me, that's probably one of the reasons why I have a very, very strong self-critic. But it's also one of the reasons why I'm able to put something down on paper and then come back to it and say, this is important, this is not. Um, and learning that process alongside editors who had been at it for many years and were far more advanced than I was, I think that really informed a lot of what I do. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I don't know. I've, I always thought it would be kind of cool to have a mentor. I haven't had one. I guess maybe my mentors are the, the authors that I knew whose work I really love. Mm -hmm. And I would say right now, one of my absolute favorites is uh, Celeste Eng. I think she's phenomenal. She, I, I don't think she could write anything bad even if she wrote it on a paper bag. She's brilliant. Well, say her name again. Celeste Eng. I don't know. She, so she's the author of Little Fires Everywhere, which was made into a so-so eh, television series. The book is way better. Definitely read the book. 
and also, um, oh gosh, Jody, can you help me with what the name of her first book is? Oh, I'm struggling the same. I'm um, about it. It's on my Kindle. I'm quickly trying to look it up since neither of us are remembering. Yeah, um, she had everything. Oops. Everything I never told you. Everything yeah. I never told you. Right. Yeah. And that one, I actually think I like that book better. So if you're interested in finding an author you haven't read before and you, you like fiction, I would highly recommend everything. Yeah. I never Could you spell you. her last name? NG. Ah, okay. Is that I'm sending, I just sent the link out for everybody oh, to yeah. her website. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Did you, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you develop the story arc of what you do? You know, the, the, you know, from a bunch of pieces and stuff to creating the arc of the, 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 the formation of the story. Sure. Yeah. I think it's partly intuitive for me. Um, but it definitely comes from, you know, that step where I, I narrate my notes into a recorder and then I transcribe it and I look at it. I start looking at the notes and I try to figure out, for me, um, the piece doesn't really get started until I have the name. So that's usually the first paragraph or the first three paragraphs. Um, so until I really have that piece that I can kind of hang the whole story on, um, I, I have a hard time getting into it. But once I've got that, it usually is pretty easy to develop where the story needs to go. It sometimes is chronological, you know, if it's like, a, if it's a weekend in story, then it might be on day one, I did these things on day one, day two, I did these things. When it's more free form, like the story I read today, um, that tends to be more of finding those high points that I talked about before, you know, those like four to five things that are super important that I want to make sure I get those across in the story. Um, so I actually will write a very basic outline that has the four or five things. And then the stuff that's smaller that I like that I maybe don't want to get rid of just yet, but I'm not sure if it has a place, I kind of relegate those to their own little section. Um, and sometimes I find if I can't get the lead right away, uh, I will try sort of starting in the center with kind of the practical parts of the piece. You know, we drove here, we did this. Um, and I think a lot of other writers have much more success with it than I do. For me, it's all about getting that lead. Okay, thanks. You answered the questions really well, by the way. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. very well. Yeah. Are there, uh, have you written or do you have as a, a goal to write a, a, a longer, longer pieces, a book like Lawrence Durrell, or I've forgotten his first name, Khan, who just, who published a book about renovating a house in Morocco. Uh, oh, I love it. Awesome. <laughs> I love to look for it. Yeah, I would love to. I've kind of thrown around a couple of ideas, um, mostly in my own brain uh, and in my journal. That's one of the reasons why I like journaling in the morning too, because it's not only is it a mind dump to get rid of any of the stuff that could otherwise get in the way of the creative process, but it's a good way for me to kind of work out ideas that I have that I have not fully formed yet. Um, so yeah, I've been kind of playing with a couple of ideas. I haven't settled on any one thing yet. So that just tells me that I'm not ready. It's not ready. Uh, it needs a little more time to kind of bake in the oven, so to speak. Could you talk about this journaling? Is it like um, the, 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 the five minute journaling that is it Julia Cameron talks about? Very much like that. Yeah, for me, so I think she usually specifies four pages as the morning page method. And a lot of what Julia Cameron talks about in the artist way is tremendous. She, she really nailed it, um, you know, how to kind of keep the creative process going. Um, I don't usually get to four pages. I think I probably do uh, a page and a half maybe back and front. And it's just whatever I can get down in 10 minutes, I make myself sit down and I start writing as soon as I click the timer and I stop as soon as it's done. And it's just, you know, don't stop, keep going the entire time. So it does end up being um, a little bit of a mix. Sometimes it's if something is frustrating me or, you know, like I was very consumed with the election like we all were. Um, so that was on my mind a lot. So I, of course, I had to write like a paragraph or two about that just to get it out so that I could focus on something else. 
So yeah, I guess I, I like the idea of sort of venting on the page and getting rid of these things that can otherwise get in the way. And then it frees me up to actually do the work. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming and listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you. Very enjoyable. Robin, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Yes. Thank and you. I'm going to throw in the chat. Uh, I did just start a new blog um, this fall. Wonderful. So if you would like to find more of what I'm doing, I'm putting it in the chat right now. Perfect. One of which, is your, which is based on a story by um, E.B. White. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Sounds Rob. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you very Thank you. much. I, I enjoyed it and learned. Thank you. Thank you for setting it up. Yep. Bye bye, oh, everybody. Yeah. Happy they did a lot of great work to get this prepared. Yeah, it'll be fun to continue now that we've started them up uh, virtually to yeah. keep going. So if anyone has ideas for additional authors relatively in our area, please send the info. <laughs> okay, Thank have you. a great weekend. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Really Bye, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you.